were right. <sighs> Thank you, Patty. It is amazing to be here with you, Max, Thomas. What I love about this conversation is both these guys are very values aligned with this crowd. Open source, power to the people. You probably respect and like their work a lot. And yet, I suspect that one of you might think the other's work is going to destroy all of humanity. So, <laughs> let's get into it. Max, I want to start with you. Just sort of set the table. How comprehensible will the world of 10 years be? Will it be compared to today, like what today is like 10 years ago, or like what today is compared to 50 years ago, 100 years ago? How fast is this happening? You know, from my perspective as a hardcore nerd, the professor has been doing AI research at MIT for many, many years. I really don't like these, this question, what will happen? If it, as if we here are some kind of pathetic, passive bystanders just sitting here eating popcorn, you know, waiting for the future to happen to us. I think we have a fork in the road. And if we take the wrong turn and build AGI and lose control over it, the, there's a reasonable chance we'll all be dead in 10 years or at least live in some horrible dystopia where we're totally disempowered to machines. Whereas if we take the correct turn, I think it can be absolutely awesome beyond our wildest dreams where it's as close to today as, as we want it to be. That's a pretty important fork. Thomas, do you, yeah. can you, do you think he's being a little apocalyptic? Do you think the fork is actually that serious? Either we're like in heaven or we're all dead? No, I don't think so. No, I think there will be turbulence. And I also think that most of the way we try to predict the future today are wrong. It's a little bit like when you try to explain from someone before the internet, you know, the 90s, that today we spend like an average nine hours per day on our screen, right? People will be like, no, that's not possible. I don't trust you. I can't project my world of today in, in the world you're describing. I think in many ways, when we describe AI world, we have this fake vision of how it's going to be. And then we either go in the apocalyptic direction, which is uh, robots are going to kill us, or we go in this utopian direction where we all love each other and our machines are helping us. So I think it's not, it's not like that. We, we need to imagine actually how AI is going to integrate in society. And my deep belief is it's going to be a lot like the internet. It's going to be everywhere. Okay. So let's talk about this fork. And let's focus on how to get this fork or make the right turn at the fork in the road. So one of the things that I read in a recent essay of yours and you've talked about, you have a, a line that you've used that we are, we are closer to building AGI than we are figuring out how to align or control it. Which I think is a very smart statement. Basically, the speed which progress is going is faster than our ability to control it. Thomas over here is making open source AI, giving AI to everybody, making sure that everybody has access to that. Isn't that going to cause big problems? I love open source. You know, MIT, where I work, is arguably the, the cradle of open source. And, and who has ever used the MIT license on your open source <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> but, this is uh, a nerdy audience. That's awesome. Yeah, Good job, I, audience. I like it. Uh, but I think, uh, we sh I think whatever rule, if we as a society decide that there are certain things we should not do, you know, child pornography or some some code that lets you build bioweapons. I don't care whether it's open sourced or closed source for profit. We shouldn't do it either way. But it's a lot easier to stop it if there's two companies that are allowing it to happen than if there are 14,000. Not necessarily, because if, if, if there's two companies, then it just becomes one company that gets so powerful it can start doing regulatory capture over the, the regulators, and uh, you can't stop it at all. I, I really think it's important to democratize this power and have it not just all sit and have some tech bros and, and one back dark boardroom in Silicon Valley decide things for the rest of us. Thomas, how do you think... <laughs> who's, who's not clapping for that? Who actually wants people in a dank boardroom to be deciding things for us? Thomas, how do you make sure the proper safety controls are built into open source models so that we don't end up taking the wrong fork into this world of death and peril? 
I think we tend to associate close model with trust a lot, which is, I think, very wrong. If you, if you make a list today of all the misuse of AI, the deep fakes, the fake news generation, you will be quite surprised that they're pretty much all done with closed source model. So that's the first step, I would say, which is this dichotomy saying open source is dangerous, but closed source is all safe. There won't be any misuse of, op of closed source model, I think is, is very, is very um, wrong in the end. It's incredibly interesting because that's true, <laughs> but it's Thanks. not necessarily true, right? Like it is easier to do bad things with open source. Though? But fewer people are doing that. And is that just because fewer people are using open source or is there something about the culture? I think by construction, closed source models are also made to be very easy to use because they want, it's a product. They want a lot of people to use it. So the entry barrier, if you want today to generate 10,000 completion with a model, you would generally go to one of the largest AI company, right? It will be also the cheapest way. Um, but another thing about closed source also that we thought, okay, it's trust, it, it, like if it's, if it's closed, if it's secret, we're all safe, okay? Now what we see is also these companies are not like military bunkers. People come and go from one to the other, like a lot of people at OpenAI have been living. Now on Tropic, not, not a lot of people have been living until now, I would say, right? And these people go to create new companies and they form small people who know now how to build LMs, go to create new company, then appears Mistral, then appears character, yeah. So this idea that, you know, uh, if we just, you know, keep, a lot, if keep people in these two or three companies, we're all safe, I think is really also misunderstanding how fluid the whole AI field is. All right, so you guys actually agree. You want AI dispersed, you want lots of people, you guys are in favor of open source. That's the world of AI you want. Are we going there or are we actually consolidating? I think the bigger fork in the road, frankly, is whether we're trying to build a bunch of increasingly awesome tools. By definition, a tool is something that the user can control. Like, you want your car to be as powerful as possible, but you don't want to lose control over it. And in the same way, I, I feel strongly, we humans, we want to build AI as po powerful as possible and not lose control over it. It's going to benefit us. And if you, if you listen to someone like Jeff Hinton warning that we're going to lose control if we build AGI, you know, he, he's not thinking of this as just another little technology like the internet. He's thinking of it as building a new species that's way, way smarter than us, robots, building robot factories. It's trivial to see how you could lose control over that. Uh, now, I think rushing in that direction before we figured out to control it is a really, really bad idea. <laughs> Incredibly dumb. And it's also, interestingly, unnecessary because I've been going around here talking to people about all the things they're excited about with AI. And it's all tool AI. Someone wants to cure cancer. Someone wants to turn CO2 into jet fuel, etc. This is tool AI. We don't need AGI to have all these great benefits. But I agree. I think the direction towards AGI is the biggest error the AI industry has made. But that's where we're going. That's where all the money is pointed right now. I disagree with this, this inevitability framing that we're going there, whether we like it or not, so just suck it up. I think it's too pessimistic. It's, it's gloom, gloomer, gloomers going around and saying this. You know, suppose I told you that you know, I have a new, um, I'm a biotech guy. I, it's inevitable I'm going to release this new medicine next year. I, I'm hoping I'll make it safe first. You know, if I went to the FDA, they would laugh me out of the office. And, and if we have a society, just some safety standards, just like all other industries have, saying you can only sell tools once you show that they actually are tools and can be controlled, then we can have all these great things that you're trying to build here at Web Summit. And the, friend, the people who want to build AGI will have to wait until they can demonstrate to the experts that they've figured out how to control it, which they can't right now. Thomas, can, can we talk about robotics for a minute, actually, another one of your passions? So I saw Jeff Hinton in the intro video, and we've mentioned him on stage. So I was uh, at Collision in Toronto, sister conference, a year ago with Jeff Hinton, and I was interviewing him, and I was about to go on stage. And I'm with my two older sons, 
And uh, he says to them, you guys going to go into media like your dad? And my oldest son says, no. And Jeff says, good. And then my son says, what should I do? And he says, you should be a plumber. That won't get taken away by AI. So my question for you, my son gave up his media career, dropped out of school and is training to be a plumber. Is that the right choice? Or is robotics AI going to come from plumbers? Yeah, so my, my, my prediction for next year is uh, it's going to be the year of robotics and ro open source robotics. This is starting to work in the past few months and it's as every development in AI, we see it's again exponential. Wow. You know, we had simple tasks, now we see robots. I was reading a paper in the plane, they have a robot uh, throwing a pan to have like an egg flipping around. This is like super dynamic. It works, it works. And it's open source as well, which is great. But that's not the topic. But yeah, robotics is going to happen next year. There's a little bit of price, price of robots, but this is also this decreasing. And because we can use neural network to compensate for some limitations of hardware, I think it's going to go to a really low price. And then what's left, right? What is, what is the ultimate? Maybe a question for you. What is the ultimate human task in the future? Is it the, for me, let me say it would be maybe the one person CEO of a, a huge company, like the maybe creator of something? I, I think you're totally right about robotics. I mean, the difficult thing that's held up robotics has not been our ability to make hinges and motors and actuators. It's the intelligence in them. So it's very natural that when the intelligence itself goes down, gets vastly better, so does robotics. I think uh, the question of what is it that we humans are always going to be better than machines at is the wrong question. We should never, we, our brains are biological computers. That's what I think. And there's no reason to think that there is anything that we can do now that machines couldn't in principle do better if we want that to happen. Um, but we are building this future, so why on earth should we ever build a future where we're forcing ourselves to compete with machines? It's completely you ridiculous. If we find that we get meaning in our lives, for example, from um, raising our children ourselves or working as nurses, we are not forced to replace ourselves by robots and have to compete like that. I think, I think we've, we need to rebrand our species. You know, we call ourselves Homo sapiens because we inflated our ego by being, we're so sapient, we're the smart ones, right? If we're going to live in a world with smarter machines, we need to realize that there's something else that's much more valuable about humanity than our intelligence. And, and ask, okay, what do we want to delegate to machines? I don't think it should be everything. So, okay, we, we've circled around this a couple of times, which is, you feel like there is a different choice that needs to be made by society, by us at a structural level. You have to your left, a man very responsible for a lot of the architecture that will mm -hmm. power these robots, that will power these machines. What should he do tomorrow that he's not doing right now? I think he and, and all of us should go tell our political leaders that look, you know, all other industries we have safety standards. We have safety standards for medicines, for airplanes. That's why we felt so safe when we flew here. Let's have safety standards for AI as well. The only reason we don't is because AI is a new kid on the block. And, ooh, nice. And once, this is not rocket science, once we have safety standards, then companies and entrepreneurs like all of you will start to innovate to meet those standards. Whoever meets them first gets the biggest market share. And, and the most basic safety standard red line is obviously that the tool should be a tool. If the company can't convince the, right, the experts that they're going to keep control over their AGI, well, come back when you can, buddy. You know, and in the meantime, we can innovate and do all this other great stuff without having this specter of, of loss of control hanging over us. Well, we happen to have a new political leader in my country, and I will uh, go back and send him a DM on Truth Social when we're done making this argument. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. Let's talk about international geopolitics. So in America, we did just have this election, and the only time AI came up in any way 
was for the two candidates to agree that China should not get AI, whatever that means. And you have argued forcefully that this is not the right approach. Will you explain why, Max? Yeah, I call this geopolitical race to build AGI before the other guy, the hopium war. Because it's fueled by hopium, just delusional hope that AGI can be controlled. Which it, it's a, we really don't know how to do. So it's, it's, not, it's not an arms race between the US and China. It's a, a suicide race where whoever gets AGI first is going to lose control of, to this future machine species or whatever and ruin it for everyone. So, so no, uh, this, is a, this is not a game that the Chinese government has any incentive to play. They like their power. Why would they let some Chinese AI company build AGI and so they would lose control? Similarly, the U.S. wants to keep its power. I, I think the U.S. and China both will realize that they just need to make sure that none of their own companies lose control over, a, some, over AGI. And then I think what will happen is, once they've done that independently of each other, just put in national safety standards, just like they did for medicines and airplanes, then they'll talk to each other and be like, hey, wait a minute, how can we make sure North Korea doesn't build AGI or some other country. And then they'll push the rest of the world to sign an AGI moratorium treaty where, where no one does it until the control problem has been solved. That's how I, that's my positive vision for how this is going to go. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable vision and it's, it's very rare to hear that in the current discourse. Thomas, can I ask you, when it comes to geopolitics, do you put any restrictions on non-democratic countries using the tools you build in any ways? And is there a point at which they could become so powerful that you would do that in a, in a deep way? It's a good question. Um, so we, we are actually rather hard to access from China because we didn't spend really uh, the time investment. I think generally we are, we are, we are, we are like a European US based company, but it's also true China is growing a lot. The best open source model I was telling you, are, are, some of them are Chinese today, right, Quen? Yeah. So it's also hard to ignore that. Um, yeah, we didn't have, a lot of the time we see ourselves as kind of a Switzerland of AI, which is kind of a neutral place. The question is how long we can hold this position if there is like political races. Uh, for now, we've been able to hold this politi but position. But Switzerland's fine when you're making chocolates, right? But if your AI is being used for <laughs> something bigger, I think for now, AI is a lot of chocolates. We should eat it and enjoy it and build great product with it. Uh, but maybe in the future, yeah, it's going to be more dangerous. Since our time is up, can I just say something positive here? Because we've talked he about... You just called AI chocolates. How much more positive <laughs> can you get? But yes, Even more. Max. Because I think we've talked about some gloomy stuff that happens if we take the wrong turn. But I, I think is we have to remember the positive side also. You know, it's absolutely amazing how far we have come as a species from being utterly disempowered without science and tech, you know, having a life expectancy of 29 years old, etc. And I think the ultimate empowerment can be AI tools. If we can use ever more powerful AI tools that do what we want to amplify human intelligence, there's basically no limit to how amazing a future we can build together. So. Let's stay away from geopolitical pissing contests <laughs> that nobody wins and build a great future together. All right. That was a marvelous, wonderful, informative panel. Thank you to the nerdiest opening act Pharrell has ever had.